Okay, this is the meeting that used to be our key signing circular firing squad. We're no longer promoting PGP, and if you want to know why, it's in uh, previous year's uh, presentations. But the tradition of having a cryptology annual news update and historical vignette as September continues despite not having a key signing. So here we are. Starting with the news, I posit that out of an abundance of caution is what uh, CIOs and their uh, PR flex use as a translation for, oh, damn. OpenSSL had a, a vulnerability 10 years after Heartbleed that was pretty much the same. Um, wasn't quite as bad as initially flagged, but uh, hopefully you've applied the patches in the last 10 months. There's this new call technology called passkeys that you may have seen on the discussion list which uh, use your eyeball and your phone being in range to log you into things uh, instead of uh, passwords and uh, random clock numbers or um, uh, one-time pins. The, uh, over on the uh, Wednesday Senior Citizen Free Software Group, a uh, comment was made that this is making things extra hard on personal representatives, uh, powers of attorney, and, and executors, uh, since it requires both the Bluetooth and the eyeball. Uh, but uh, somebody else there said that uh, they can also provide dongles that override that, which is a good thing. So they thought about it. Most of our cryptography uses extended precision arithmetic. Well, there was a bug in the underlying integer computations. Just wonderful. Last pass. Supposedly, their breach didn't harm their customers, at least if they had a strong passphrase. There have been reports of crypto coin wallets whose passphrases were saved in a LastPass um, bundle getting burgled. On the other hand, as we'll see uh, later in the list of oopsies, there may have been a different the uh, way people got their last pass, I uh, got their uh, Bitcoin stolen. So maybe it wasn't last pass after all, or maybe their strong passphrase that used all four character types uh, wasn't all that strong. Unclear. We've still got cute named uh, exploits. I'm only telling you the ones that have to do with cryptology. Um, Zen bleed, collide, power, downfall, inception are all in the category of uh, hardware observables uh, bleeding over from one virtual machine or process to another so that a process that shouldn't be able to watch you read your key uh, can watch you read your key if 17 different uh, assumptions are granted. It's not half as scary as they want you to think it is, but it still makes using the cloud for anything that's uh, high privacy, like banking, um, a, a threatening idea. More startling, uh, secure radios 
that are the European and rest of world equivalent of the American P-25 uh, and trunked uh, Motorola trunking radio systems had their uh, encryption uh, reverse engineered. Uh, as usual, if you defy Kirchhoff's principle that the uh, having the device in hand uh, and full understanding of the device shouldn't uh, shouldn't break the device. Only getting a hold of the key should break the device. Well, commercial companies like proprietary encryption where the algorithm is secret because it keeps it um, keeps competition only to members of the club. You can't have off-brand open source uh, products competing with their high profit proprietary products. So they insist on inventing their own proprietary encryptions, which regularly turn out to be crap once they're understood. And this again happened. Now, I'm not buying that the uh, export anywhere, including the uh, countries we hate version, uh, used many less than the full 80 bits in it that you had to enter for the key in the actual key because before 1997, and this is an old standard, um, it, 40 bits was the maximum size allowed for uh, export. I think, you know, Netscape 1.0. Um, and that it used 32 bits instead of 40 bits is ho-hum. Yeah, it's 128 uh, factor, but, you know, back then, Anybody that thought the export approved one wasn't crap, wasn't paying attention. Uh, so the fact that a lot of police departments in countries we didn't like uh, adopted this uh, meant that, yeah, the NSA and even second-rate country intelligence agencies could listen to their radios. Um, shocking. Shocking, I say. More interesting to me, is the overall protocol for all used for all four and now six because they've issued two new ones after um, this breach was responsibly disclosed. Um, the protocol uh, uses the network time uh, to set the initialization vector for the encryption. Uh, and network time is not um, authenticated, so it's spoofable, so that you can use a captured device as an oracle uh, to um, guess keys. Um, is that incompetence, or was that a backdoor inserted so that um, national technical means at the big friendly countries could read everybody's stuff. We don't know. Um, not good, though. There's been much discussion about how chat GPT and autopilot and similar large language model, um, not really machine learning, not really artificial intelligence, but you know, they're artificial ignorance systems um will feed you back other people's copyright code uh or copyright paragraphs uh and so automate uh violation of copyrights well it's also regurgitated people's secret keys when you ask it to write an encryption module for you because it memorized the embedded secret key in the source code that it memorized for how to write a secret key encryption module. <sighs> so chat GPT gets assigned to the Dunning-Kruger cryptography department along with the uh, all the people that are rolling their own incompetently for their crypto claims and 
uh, proprietary radios. Apparently, Python has an encryption um, PKCS sort of um, library called Fernet. And it works well enough that malware authors have started using Fernet for their payloads. So I ask, uh, should we, should the Fernet using malware be called malortware? But it looks like it's actually, um, if you don't screw up the key management, uh, a decent encryption because it, it's not only using good standards, it's using them correctly. Um, but of course, you know, key management is everything. We'll get to that. Key management is hard. Look who lost their keys this year. Microsoft had an expired signing key exfiltrated using the SolarWinds network management hacks, which were exploited by both the Russians and the Chinese and probably the Koreans, North Koreans, uh, and who knows who else. Um, and then Azure failed to check if modules that were signed by a trusted signing key uh, were signed with an expired signing key. And so Azure accepted malware signed with the exfiltrated expired signing key. Fault chain longer than one. Got to look out for those fault chains longer than one, guys. Whoever MicroStar International, I guess they're motherboard firmware type people, had its UAEFE signing key stolen. Uh, it says last month that would be April. Um, GitHub accidentally uh, published a repo that contained their SSH host key. Um, they took the repo down as fast as they noticed. They weren't sure how long it had been uh, posted dirty, so they had to go through and change all of their uh, SSH host keys, which caused everyone to get a, you may be being man in the middle warning until they flushed their re remembered GitHub host key and trains everybody to distrust the you may be being intercepted message. Thank you. So, you know, first, don't add any secrets to your GitHub repos, even if they're private repos, because you might decide later to publish your private repo. And when you're publishing a private repo public, you need to comb it not just for licenses and intellectual property, but you need to comb it for secrets. And we'll see more key management problems. I've been saying for years that crypto coins aren't crypto and they don't get to steal my word. And they aren't coins either. It's Ponzi all the way down. But there was a new bon mot, Bitcoin, the most powerful bug bounty program ever. Um, and both uh, Gerard, the um, uh, 50,000 foot blockchain guy, and Nick Weaver have done some nice writing in the last year on uh, just how bad things are in the world of crypto coins. You can you can read their stuff on the links once I give Jabber the stuff. Yes, Jabber, I'll send you the uh, not only this file, but the one with extended notes. Um, and key management is hard again. A so-called fintech startup, Prime Trust, what a name, lost the encryption key to its hardware wallet and the recovery key, and therefore um, lost their pile of bitcoins or whatever coins they were hoarding. <sighs> um. Some people deserve to be bankrupt. Key management. Another cutely named one. A flaw in a popular Bitcoin 
implementation library uh, exposed users of it who followed standard cookbooks um, to create a wallet with a basically easy to guess um, key for the wallet. Uh, again, is this Dunning-Kruger Club cryptography? Is this incompetence because they didn't read the don't roll your own crypto rule or and thought they were the exception because they're the smartest guy in the room? Or was it an intentional backdoor to facilitate thefts? There is some hint that um, the library ceased being maintained after the theft started, not after it was blown open. So it may have been intentional all along. We don't know. Um, why is it called Milksad? Because if you generate a um, long, many, many, many word passphrase with a system time of zero, um, the lack of entropy other than system time results in a bunch of words starting with Milksad. So that's one. It's... And the library people claim, well, our library documentation says never use the BX seed, but the O'Reilly book for how to do Bitcoin says use the BX seed for your wallet. So um, while some people say this was a novice mistake, and there is the old rule, never attribute to malice. It, it it does look like somebody was scamming the scam. It, it's Ponzi or just embezzlement all the way down. If it hurts when you do that, don't do that. Next. Okay. Lately, we've had to dis discuss quantum cryptography because people are worried about it. Um quick blast through what we've discussed in previous years uh, quantum cryptography quantum computation is measured in qubits not bits where a bit can be some percentage true so this is like uh, fuzzy math except in hardware quantum hardware there are two kinds of quantum hardware the huge qubit counts in quantum annealing systems are great for many practical problems, not good for cryptography. Um, the ones, and they're actually relatively easy to build. They're, they're sort of practical now. Uh, the true quantum cell circuit logics, the practical machines have a smaller number of qubits and have reliability issues. Uh, but they're the ones that, in theory, could have a major impact on cryptography. Now, why are we discussing post-quantum cryptography before quantum computing actually succeeds? Because if quantum computing does what we think and hope it will be able to do for numeric computation, it will make obsolete RSA public key and Diffie-Hellman public key cryptography, which is the mainstay of the original um, PKI public key infrastructure that we've all been using. Uh, so we have to, <clears throat> on the off chance that quantum computation actually makes quantum cryptanalysis work, which it does in theory, and in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, not so much. Uh, but in case it actually works, we need to start pivoting to replacement public key encryptions and signatures uh, that fit the PKI recipes that we've been using, but use encryption primitives that are not susceptible to quantum cryptanalysis. 
in theory, Shor's algorithm or Grover's or the VQF um, can break anything that requires factoring elliptic curves or discrete log being hard. They may be hard on classical computers, but in theory, they're not hard on quantum computers. What is hard on quantum computers is doing large computations um, between the mean time between failure. So we're currently at the state we were with vacuum tube computers uh, in the late 30s and very early 40s, where the mean time between failure of vacuum tubes used in logic circuits was uh, less than the running time of an algorithm. Uh, the British post office had a genius who figured out how to make the vacuum tubes reliable during World War II, and we've sort of discussed that in previous years. And we have to take this seriously before it occurs, because if it occurs, there, there is a failure of forward secrecy problem. Uh, the NSA has the world's largest data lake in Utah. That's a Greenpeace photo there that they've photoshopped a uh, blimp onto. Either that or they flew the blimp over it and took a picture from their biplane. I'm not sure which, and I don't care. It's a beautiful picture. Um, they're already saving messages that they can't break for when they're breakable, either because the key is exposed or new technology lets them. We know they're doing it. They got the budget to do it. There's the building. And it's worked for them in the past. Um, uh, both Venona and G projects, uh, the precursor to the NSA, saved messages they couldn't break in World War II and early Cold War. And they figured out how to break them later. Um, and that helped them round up the atom spies and all sorts of other things. And so, you know, they, they have track record at uh, hoarding old messages and processing them later uh, when they get a new clue. Uh, you don't have to read Snowden to figure this out. And if you want to keep your security clearance, don't read Snowden. So, National Bureau of Standards, who, you know, the guilty have changed their name. Now they're NIST. Okay, whatever. Um, has initiated the post-quantum cryptography standards process uh, to plan and compete and carefully choose uh, replacements for RSA elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman uh, that will provide protection in a post-quantum cryptography world. And they started this progress process several years ago and are well down the road and are working to keep us safe. Um, the um, So this is being run the same way their AES and SHA-3 competitions worked. Uh, they had, uh, the third, was it, uh, post-quantum cryptography conference last March. Uh, they released a video on how to prepare your PKI system, uh, in April. The White House Cybersecurity Initiative, um, also discussed it. All sorts of good stuff. There's an academic paper. This is the new stuff not from here. Uh, maybe obvious. I started talking about this here. Um, the, uh, there's a Chinese academic paper claiming that theoretically RSA 2048 is in play for current available quantum computing systems. Um, this is theoretically accurate, shouldn't be a surprise. 
uh, the uh, IBM system has 433 uh, qubits usable for real algorithms. And with sure algorithm pre-processing, you only need 370 for a 2048 uh, RSA key. So in theory, um, there's reason to believe they haven't actually done it. Um, and that uh, the meantime between failure of uh, uh, quantum consistency may prevent it working uh, for the foreseeable future. But, you know, somebody needs to, like, try it on the IBM system and tell us what happened. I'd be surprised if nobody has huh, done so yet. But, you know, if, if somebody's done it and it worked, they probably got told that's classified. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a little leery. Um, the uh, Bruce Schneier, um, the uh, sort of my opinion leader on such matters, uh, wrote a nice essay this year on you can't rush post-quantum computing cryptography standards. Um, and yeah, he's pretty right on that. The, uh, the good news is that the FIDO people um, have quantum res resistant hybrid signing um, for their two-factor Roth. That means they're layering classical and uh, post-quantum algorithms so that if either breaks, you're still protected by the other one. Uh, a lot of uh, the PQC stuff will be double layered like that initially. Um, bad news is there is a not just theoretical, but not a uh, side channel attack um, against an implementation of <clears throat> one of the algorithms that's uh, in the standards track of the uh, competition mentioned. Um, this does not mean the algorithm is broken. It, Even though you'll see some articles that claim that by uh, headline editors that care more about clicks than they do about truth. Um, but I will disagree with Bruce about just a side channel attack. The Tetra um, project that I mentioned in the first segment used a side channel attack to uh, rip the firmware out of a supposedly protected proprietary radio. Uh, side channel attacks um, do, do side channel attacks mean that you need to keep other people from executing on the same machine and uh, need to make sure if the lid is taken off, um, memory is zeroed um, actively or something. It's uh, just uh, adds to the danger that there are ways to combine layers of attacks so the current schedule, um, draft standards were released uh, last month. That FIPS, which is Federal Information Processing Standards. Um, fifth conference is scheduled for April. Uh, they have published the request for comments on the draft standards. And they will discuss how they respond to those comments at the conference. And then later next year, uh, they will issue, presumably slightly revised, uh, FIP standards for the post-quantum uh, winning algorithms and then uh, implementations that are complying will be allowed on federal computers. Once certification 
is available in 25, 26. Um, then there'll be FIPS approved implementations. And after their FIPS approved implementations, they will start requiring FIPS approved implementations for use on uh, federal unclassified systems and presumably similar, but more strenuous for classified. In addition to the uh, side channel attack, uh, there are a bunch of known weekend weaknesses. Of the 69 entrants in rounds one to four of the competition, uh, 62 of 69 uh, were broken by their competitors' uh, red teams, and two of the front runners were knocked out that way. One of the still front runners uh, has a classical problem that if there's a lack of randomness in salting the um, uh, small things being encrypted, if you're encrypting small things like passwords, um, we've been warning against uh, encrypting small things for literally decades. Um, the uh it, it leaks information um and people might think that well you know people aren't going to be that stupid are they well it keeps happening um so uh whether people are too stupid or lazy uh or think they're smarter than the previous generation of programmers um, we need to remind people, lack of salt, hello, um, lack of salt is key reuse. Um, if you break system random, uh, you may be generating host keys for SSH with random seed of zero or random seed of low bits of clock time, which is not terribly random. Um, there, there's just too many instances of uh, people thinking they're perfectly protected and the amount of randomness that went into their random number was so low that somebody that notices that there was no randomness in their randomness can predict what their secret random number was and unwind things from there. It happens just too often. Um, the Tetra IV uh, vulnerability that might or might not be a backdoor is another example of this. Um, it's actually an old example. It was only recently disclosed, but yeah. So that's the state of post-quantum. This year's historical vignette, NSA and consumer products. Back in the early 80s, people realized that hauling around a luggable computer so that you could do um, encrypted messaging or email uh, from the airport payphone was bad for your uh, carry-on limit. And maybe they should design a pocket telex machine that would be easier to carry than the big luggable that uh, I inherited on my desk in 1980 and was a lot of fun, but it was too heavy to take on the road, which is why I inherited it meant that if I was willing to give up my desk phone, I could work from the office instead of going down to the terminal room. It was fun. Oh, except when my office mate wanted to receive a phone call. Um, so a company in the Netherlands uh, developed the Pocket Telex PX1000 text communicator, which ha uh, they used an OEM uh, to build the system, uh, had an alphanumeric keyboard or one-line display, and had built-in DES standard encryption 
and actually had an acoustic coupler that and would still fit in your pocket. Amazing. Um, they mostly sold these through the giant company Philips. Um, but they had other resellers in specific countries and even sold a few under their own brand name. Um, well, NSA and GCHQ thought that letting civilians have access to 56 bit DES was just a little bit too much um, and uh, leaned on Philips government systems and had Philips government systems lean on Philips consumer because, you know, as mentioned under Tetra, you were supposed to only be selling 40-bit encryption to naughty countries. Um, and we're, we weren't supposed to be giving 56-bit encryption to people that we didn't approve of. And so um, Philips leaned on their original equipment maker, Textlight BV, who quickly came out with a version that had a blue key instead of a red key. The red key says um, key text code and came out with a blue key that turned on calculator mode. And that was sold for the next year while um, Philips developed an alternative encryption system using an algorithm recommended by the NSA, uh, monitored by TextLite's own programmers because TextLite didn't want to accept a backdoor. And so they were looking over Phillips's shoulder to make sure there wasn't an obvious backdoor in the code that Phillips was writing under the NSA design. Um, and NSA offered Phillips a large wad of cash for all unsold DES units and uh, for all of the ROMs that TextLite had already burned uh, to make DES units uh, at a nice wholesale profit to make sure that they weren't still in the uh, uh, retail uh, supply chain. And that NSA approved version got a CR appended to its model number, PX1000CR, CR for crypto. And then shortly after that, a CMail capable version of both the uh, crypto free and CR crypto units came out um, that could communicate with uh, multiple commercial email providers. This was followed by um, PX12,000 and PX2,000, 1200 and PX2,000 versions, the latter being manufactured by a different company in Japan than the original uh, OEMs OEM, and also sold under Philips and Textel brands worldwide. I'm going to open this old tweet so that we can see the cute box. This is the 1200 um, and the funny thing is the product photo on the box shows a 1200 saying this is the text light PX1000 on a box that says 1200 hilarious and then this is the box of the Philips 1000 with the textile brand on it also and crypto museum is the Netherlands online and I think real world museum uh, that uh, we'll be referencing frequently but Foon has the only uh, 1200 in captivity that I'm aware of. So in 2014, a Dutch 
bachelor's thesis looked into government intervention on consumer hardware, comparing the ROMs of the museum's original edition and uh, CR edition of the PX1000. And the thesis also raised the question, since the Netherlands-based support team for uh, political prisoner Nelson Mandela's uh, preparation for freedom, preparation for return to political life, uh, were using PX1000s to communicate. Uh, was that support team's communications compromised uh, to big power national means? Which was an interesting question. In 2019, the Crypto Museum publicly reported on the above research, which they'd previously supported. In 2021, Steph Marisk completed the analysis of the NSA version, which uh, Ben had um, only started, um, and determined that the key space that was actually used was like on the Tetra, a mere 32 bits um, being selected from a larger offered key. Uh, and he also developed a full break um, from 17 bits of output. Uh, he could compute the message key, which is a very rapid crack of a linear shift feedback register. There'd been a lot of research in the prior decade into rapid convergence of uh, LSFR uh, cracking, uh, which uh, uh, Steph very, very effectively leveraged here. Um, awesome, awesome bit of work. The um, and he observed other weaknesses that might be a backdoor besides the uh, short key length. The why did the um, text tell text light programmers not notice a backdoor. Um, it combined four linear shift feedback registers, which were uh, had maximal period um, and they were uh, seemingly combined sensibly. So it's not obviously suspect. Um, however, the implementation leaks some keystream bits. Uh, this is a 7-bit ASCII device, uh, which means that you can predict that the high bit of every byte is zero, which means the high bit of every enciphered byte is raw keystream bit. I'm not sure if there were other leaks other than that, but the fact that it was not compressing um, eight, seven bit characters uh, into seven, eight bit characters before encrypting did mean that it was leaking keystream bits or you know expanding your keystream to um, pad zeros for the high bits either way. Uh, so it, it was leaking keystream bits, which, if nothing else, would make um, detecting key reuse easy. And once you've detected key reuse, you XOR the two messages and you wind up with a message which is one plain text enciphered with the other plain text, uh, which is you know, basically the old book cipher problem. Uh, once you guess one word, you can uh, expand the break in op each direction, uh, cross-riffing the dummy, um, and uh, crack the whole thing by hand. And then you've got the key, and you can do the, any other message in that key. 
very dangerous. Um, and NSA should have realized that uh, allowing the high key bit to escape was dangerous. So did they leave it in intentionally? Maybe. So that's this year's vignette. Um, the uh, Jabber will post the YouTube. Uh, I'll send both these slides and the longer form um, uh, notes file. Uh, actually, since uh, this went fairly quickly, I'm going to switch over to the notes file, which has a bit more on the uh, historical Here we go. Um, here's the uh, interior board. Uh, of one of these devices laid on top of the device. The um, part of Steph's break was uh, translating the linear shift feedback registers uh, operation into a Boolean functional equivalent, uh, which is this mess of an expression we see here, which put it in a form where a binary satisfaction problem theorem prover similar to prologue except for Boolean expressions, um, could be used to solve it. As with traveling salesmen, th this problem is incomplete in general in theory, but tractable in normal cases. In 2021, solving one of these with the 17 characters of output took 50 seconds on a single thread uh, personal computer, which might have been a bit expensive to do on NSA computers in 1985, um, but would have been a heck of a lot easier than uh, cracking DES on NSA's uh, craze in 1985. Uh, so it was to their advantage. And as mentioned with the leaking keystream, they had other options. Um, now, why did they not want to do, why did they object to DES going out to everybody? Um, in 1977, the open literature community estimated that you could build a specialized DES cracking machine for $20 million, 1977 dollars. The open community's estimate dropped to $1 million in 1993 dollars, uh, which is a you know double decrease because the dollar was worth less. Um, as far as we know, nobody built one in that period. Um, but with NSA and GCHQ buying multiple Cray ones at $8 million each, I would kind of assume they built at least one. But if they only had one, it would be a scarce resource and they'd need to allocate it on um, importance of research basis the way time on uh, Hubble and Webb space telescopes is allocated by how much science can you get per hour of instrument. Um, and so discouraging the use of DES by people with something to hide uh, and restricting it to friendly governments and um, banks that we don't need to spy on because they'll tell us what we need to know uh, was preferable. And let's get some get these people with their pocket telexes using something cheaper to crack. Uh, in 1998, the EFF 
um, developed actual hardware for a quarter million after there was an internet screensaver hack in 97. Oh, uh, for the last decade, the, uh, I think it's Moxie Marlin Spike has had a custom device that was a mere 100K cost to him, FPGAs and uh, graphics processors on a monster board um, that he rents time on uh, to crack DES that you want to crack at multiple prices and service levels. And his top price is $1,000, but he's, he's not offering uh, full message cracking. This is, he's only offering uh, breaking of network tokens that he thinks people should stop using. And so to convince people to stop using them, he's making it cheap and easy to break them, which will allow a system security officer to intercept a token, send it to Moxie for cheap, break it, show the auditor, uh, and then the auditor tells the um, CIO that they have to fix it. Uh, and he'll do NTLM challenges for free if you use his preferred challenge for which he's built the world's largest rainbow table. And there's a 5% chance it won't be in the rainbow table and then you'll have to pay $20. So if you do a bunch of them, the amortized cost is a buck each. That's pretty cheap to crack DES. But basically, using symmetric encryption on small things was always a bad idea. Oh, I assume that's salted, but still, he's got the rainbow table. So the uh, footnotes for the historical vignette on Netherlands versus the NSA are mostly links through the Netherlands Crypto Museum. Good folks. Um, the uh, they have m many more photos of the device. Uh, also, uh, Steph has a published article in Proof of Concept or Get the Bad Word Out magazine um, online, a blog, and he has all of his code and PDFs of the academic papers he references in his footnotes on his GitHub. Um, the other computer history museum at Cambridge University, not Bletchley Park in the UK, uh, also has a page on the PX1000. Um, there are two copies of Steph's uh, Camp Plus Plus talk, and uh, I showed you the uh, the tweet on the X site. More pictures. Oh, and th this is the cool thing. How did they do an acoustic coupler that fit in your pocket? They used a single bimodal transducer as both microphone and speaker, and you had to physically pivot the handset to switch which direction of half duplex you were using. But that meant it was flat and didn't get too screwed up in your pocket and didn't screw up your pocket too much but fit in a pocket. I do object to using stereo connectors for power, though. And there was even a printer accessory. Yay! Then around there. And there was a audio recorder interface, um, as was common back then. It, it was quite the thing. Uh, there was 
the Scandinavian telephone company Ericsson <clears throat> wrapped the same device in their own um, off salmon skin. Sure, whatever. There was a Russian version with the family doctor software, which was another software option. More interior photos. Look at that corrosion. So there we go. And we looked at the 1200. Here is the PX2000. That is an 8 by 80 terminal emulator screen. This had both VT52 and VT100 emulation. It had a serial port. So you could use this uh, to log into a real computer as well as to send encrypted messages um, or encrypt files on its built-in storage. This was a nice little unit in 85-86. Um, it unfortunately just had that really flawed encryption. Now on this one, the encryption key was a function G as opposed to its own red key. You used red function to get the red word over the G key. And this one had a full two-way acoustic coupler built into the bottom that was detachable, which was a different brilliant option. Which solved the flat versus inclined problem. After you detached it, you could pivot it. You just needed a rubber band. Brilliant. The kids don't know how lucky they are. Acoustic couplers were the deal once memory cards what more could you ask for worked with telenet press tell telepack video text somehow it emulated tty although i doubt it did a current loop um since it was european it used a DIN socket instead of a DB25 connector for serial, which frankly is better for fitting in your pocket anyway. Um, but it was fully backwards compatible with the 1000 CR, so it was obviously the same brain damaged uh, NSA approved encryption. Um, just, just a cool little thing. Questions aside from Jabber asking when I'm going to upload. Yeah, Bill, when are you going to upload? <laughs> I'm sorry, that was over modulated. What did you say? Well, since Jabber's not going to ask you, when are you going to upload? <laughs> okay. I see Jabber commented on the Candy Model 100, mm -hmm. which was 40 by 8. And yes, um, the uh, uh, in, in about this time frame, my office had both a Model 100 and a um, French Textel um, mini term uh, that we could use, we could take home for the weekend to have remote access uh, through the DARPANET tip uh, to the uh, company machines. And yeah, I much preferred the Tandy 100 to the uh, French Minitel. Uh, the French Minitel was just a little too many. 
by the by, I saw the company that had um, kits to build a Linux system that was physically very reminiscent of the Tandy Model 100 um, has released another um, uh, Pi-based uh, portable computing kit that looks a heck of a lot like a BlackBerry. Um, and uh, you can put a wireless service SIM into it and do um, telco texting and telco internet as well as Wi-Fi internet uh, with it to have a portable texting terminal that say pocket fit. Can I can I add a comment to that? Absolutely. I unfortunately I don't remember the name, but I've had in the news and I've been following the story. I saw one review that pointed out the that this Blackberry like device it's not really a Blackberry, but it's kind of a DIY kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly the same mechanism for a trackball that Blackberry did years ago. And maybe not the same actual vendor, but you know, it, the mechanism is the same. And unfortunately, not only is it really slow, like out of the box, but it takes forever to drag your little finger across the trackball that across the screen from one side to the other. But the next version of the Blackberry that it used to have that trackball, the next version after that, that was an actual Blackberry, it had a fingerprint joystick. Like you drag your finger across a solid state sensor and they that worked much better than the, the Blackberry trackball, which kept falling apart and failing. Um, the new toy doesn't have a, a, a scanner uh, optical thing. It's, it's, it's a, a trackball. Yes, the, the the trackball was the uh, uh, weakness uh, identified on the uh, otherwise enthusiastic uh, review I saw as well. On the, the trackball BlackBerry, I went through about four black uh, four trackballs uh, uh -huh. before I upgraded to one that had a fingerprint scanner sensor. Yeah. It didn't do it didn't record your fingerprint. It would just see your fingerprint move and say that's joystick movement. So you basically we're talking about a tiny touch sensor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, un understood. Um, the, uh, and of course, some people object that it uh, keeps the cost low by uh, not having a touch screen, which would like also solve the problem of uh, the trackball deficiency, but it's uh, and all in all, it looks like a nice device. If if you're if you want a computer where you can build and program all the parts yourself, go for it. It looks nice. Yeah, I the the, uh, the, the company is Clockwork Pi, and the item is U Console. Um. The, uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, this is the first review I saw on it. Um, and the, the, the case is all metal, um, which is delightful in a DIY thing. I haven't checked the price yet. <laughs> um, but I think it's reasonable for a, a small number project. Like, yeah, you, yeah. you know that when they don't make millions of something, it costs more, and but it doesn't cost a lot more than you'd expect. Right. Um, if, if what what I'd need to do is check if uh, the Raspberry Pi software um, would allow me to configure, if I put my 
data device SIM card uh, into this, could I configure this to act as a wireless access point? I've got an Alcatel uh, thing with, you know, like a Verizon MiFi, except it's not on Verizon, um, cellular wireless access point. And if this could work as both a BlackBerry, except it doesn't make phone calls, and as a wireless access point so that I could have one non-phone SIM card in this instead of adding yet another data plan. I don't see why you couldn't do that. It, it comes with, uh, I don't, is the default operating system Raspbian, the, the um, Raspberry Pi version of Debian? If I it's not the so. default, it, it is an option. And I believe so. So you've got both the network interfaces are there. They show up in the network manager. And just uh, however you would do that on Debian, that's how you do it. It, it should work. The, the, I'm just um, dealing with variant distros, things that should work sometimes just finding the right combination of options doesn't. Uh, the Explaining Computers channel has been covering Risk Five single board computers and the like um, as sort of a, a sub thread of episodes. And the um, he was pleasantly surprised at one of the recent uh, Risk Five offerings. Um, almost everything worked out of the box. Um, there was still a list of things that didn't work out of the box, but much, much shorter than he was used to on risk five, um, boards and risk five versions of operating systems. And it was close enough that he committed to doing one week of using these two risk five boards that one of them he'd had to do some work to configure and one of them worked out of the box as his primary desktop and he reported back at the end of the week. The one thing he couldn't do on the Risk Five was he couldn't edit the video for production. The final cut video edit had to be done on the big computer, uh, mostly because, uh, uh, you know, and, you know, you sort of, might expect that on uh, um, an ARM-based unit, but on a Risk Five, you'd sort of like to think it would have the oomph to do video editing, but it just didn't work. Um, but you know, based on those sorts of thinking, uh, I, I'm not I'm not assuming Raspbian is going to let me do it easily without getting really nerdly about it. Um, you know, is it going to work out of the box such that I can just move my uh, SIM, SIM card over and be happy? I'd say maybe you could try it in an emulator, but that's the if you try to do this experiment in an emulator, you're probably not going to get access to a SIM card. And so you won't have all of the components that you need to test. Right. And, and, you know, with, with 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 emulation, either emulating hardware doesn't work or it makes it look really easy and it's hiding the complexities, one or the other. But anyway, this this U console, this Clockwork Pie company, has a bunch of interesting things. Uh, the uh, they were the ones with the model one hundred. Uh, sort of box. If you go for their Model 100 looking box, be aware that it's small keys and it's half the size of a Model 100 and you're probably not going to touch type on it. Right. If it's not going to be as big enough to touch type, I think I want to go for this smaller one yeah. with the all metal case <clears throat> that would actually fit in the con pocket um and it's a 
simple enough assembly. The video that I uh, showed the start of, he does the unboxing doing the full assembly. It's um, everything socketed. Um, and it comes with the hex driver to drive the screws in the corners. It's a, as, as DIY goes, it's simpler than Ikea. Uh, so I, I was taken by it, but, you know. Um, but it's still, I have to add, it's still DIY software. Like, it, if you're selling this to somebody else, say, like, hey, you, you should get this for your kid to play with. They can reprogram everything if they yeah. want how. Right. It, it's not like you give them a, a Google Pixel and, oh, no, you can't go there. You're not allowed to touch that part. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, so the... The the so it's 139 with the low power CPU and 189 with the uh, upgun CPU. Why would you want the low power CPU? Okay, um, a little bit less than the half size 100 bodies. Cool, cool. Um, the uh, Yeah, my goal is not to put a separate digital service SIM in each tablet or laptop or whatever, but to have one cellular wireless access point that uh, all my devices can share, including my desktop, uh, in case the... Uh, uh, fiber goes out which it has once or twice and having uh, a having a pocket console attached to that sim card is definitely handy and this would be a little over twice the size of my wireless access point which might make it easier to find in the attache bag um and having a keyboard and a small screen oh, isn't that cute the the screen lights up with focus. This one rotates. That one rotates. But these two blink. That's cute. You know, I, I like these people. <laughs> I notice it has a firm price, but it says pre-order. But, you know, for small batches, they, they need to get pre-orders to fire off the batch but um that that's that's a maybe you know, my wife was one of the people heartbroken when uh blackberries ceased making real blackberries I got my, I had a Blackberry until my phone company abandoned it and said, we're not going to support the radio bands that you're using. And I'm currently, my primary phone, I have two phones with SIM cards, but they're cheap. Yeah. Um, I, I, if you go with Telo.com, they're a reseller and you can go as low as $5 a month for a SIM card. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, my primary phone, the one with the voice uh, connection is a Titan Pocket. Uh -huh. And it's very much like a blackberry except it runs android and it supports 4g oh and real keys yeah uh well as real as a blackberry uh it i it's a little difficult to do irc at speed but i i do it anyway because i want to use irc in bed right I think the BlackBerry keyboard is marginally better, but this is good. Yeah, Titan yeah. Pocket is a, it's a good, if you really, really want a BlackBerry, get a Titan Pocket. Yeah. Don't buy it from Amazon. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. That looks plausible. Uh, that little that little Lego brick in the center is a fingerprint scanner and um, a unlock key. The the screen is touch sensitive. 
I think the keyboard might be touch drag sensitive, but I can't remember. Cool. I mean, I, I, if it is, I've turned it off, but the screen is touch sensitive. Cool. This is what I'm currently using for a phone. It's an actual Android in a retro flip case with a touch screen. It was built for construction contractors and branded with Caterpillar brand. Looks good. It's um i'm guessing that's a really strong hinge really strong hinge uh it's supposed to be able to take a six to ten foot drop to concrete um 10 meters of water submersion uh, for a rather long period of time um you know the run it over with construction equipment provided it's closed. Uh, and when I called up my phone company to see if they, who had been selling them, if they had them in stock, it had been discontinued. Delightfully, the one time I've managed to make it to the MIT swap meet since plague, there was somebody with one new in box at half price. I didn't haggle. Yeah, it looks like a razor, exactly. Um, the um, it's uh, you know at, at my son-in-law's suggestion, I uh, downloaded a couple of Star Trek original series uh, cast group photos. Uh, to be my uh, lock page and home screen. Oh, yeah, that uh, the talk about spam mailboxes reminds me I need to go back over to software tool and die and clean out my. Um, spam box oh every once in a while somebody i want to hear from uses that address still i didn't realize how close their location in uh was to where i used to live in oak square i'm maybe they moved yes they're still in business oh uh, they they charge my American Express every month. Uh, my uh, 1992 website is still up. Uh, I probably should replace it with a pointer to where my current, <laughs> current stuff is. Um, but it's still there. Who remembers the Oak Square streetcar? Yeah, I I am not old enough to have actually seen the A line run. I used to sometimes go go from downtown, uh, coming back from a doctor's appointment. I used to take. The T I took bus to Cleveland Circle, took what's now the um, C line down to um, Mass Ave Station, and then came back on the Watertown line, and then took the bus from Newton Corner. But I remember Oak Square. Yep. I, and I was still running the Oak Square streetcar at that time. Yeah, I 
I could wish the streetcar had been running when we were living there, but it wasn't. But we did have an express bus at rush hour. But the, uh, which was an improvement over the express bus service in Marlboro, let me tell you. Another bus that I, another streetcar I used to take was coming back from the same appointment. I used to take the red line to Harvard Square, and then I would take the streetcar from Harvard Square to Watertown, and then transfer to the Watertown car over to Newton Corner. The buses were not the T buses, they were uh, Middlesex and Boston Street Railway. I think the. Uh, I don't even remember that one. The MTA bought the Middlesex in Boston, I believe, in 1962 when they were bankrupt. Uh huh. And the Eastern Mass Street Railway was purchased around the same time. But from my house, I could walk to a Middlesex uh, and Boston stop. Always nice. So it was this condo building. That had a mudslide wipe out the temporary retaining wall holding the hill up. Uh -huh. um, above their parking lot and software tool and die is just two doors down from the abandoned construction site that's washing into mm -hmm. 